All righty. Uh, good morning. And uh, we are in chapter three of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I uh, put the cover of the book right there so you can see that. And uh, in case you're interested in buying, purchasing a copy of the book, highly recommend it. It's a, it's a great book. It's not perfect, but it's good. And uh, today in chapter three, we're looking at the concept of looking at your your family history and your and your past and seeing how it impacts your present, it's going how it can impact impact your future. In fact, the name for the title of the chapter is "Going Back in Order to Go Forward: Breaking the Power of the Past." And uh, something that he that Skazero says at the beginning of the chapter that stuck out to me was. Uh, this line, in fact, some of us are so accustomed to walking with such excess weight that we can't imagine living any other way. And he's he's speaking to the fact that, you know, as as you get older and you are in this family pattern, we talked about last week, the ability to differentiate from your family of origin and being able to, you know, be your own person in that. And the inability to do that is going to result and you continuing the patterns that you've established in your family, uh, in your future family, right? Or even if you're not, if you don't get an, end up getting married or have a family of your own, uh, whatever the pattern of living that you had established while you were at home, you're probably going to continue on as, as time goes on, right? And he talks about that as being this excess weight. He called it emotional baggage. Lots of people, lots of people use that term. Uh, but just this weight that you carry that you don't realize uh, you don't need to carry anymore, right? especially when it comes to family of origin. Uh, I somehow figured out before I started working my degrees and everything, uh, I remember thinking, you know what? I am not my the the father or like the replacement father to my siblings. Right? I've spoken openly before this about the past, how our dad you know, was – an alcoholic and drug user and all this stuff. And he left us uh, when we, when he, when I was 16 in 1999. And so uh, it's easy to fall into a pattern, especially since I had to start going to work and, at, you know, start saving my money and it will help my mom out around the house and, you know, do laundry and cook and clean or whatever, like whatever I had to do. Uh, it is, it would have been easy to fall into a pattern where I am now, you know, like a surrogate father, like a replacement father. Um, and I never wanted that. I, first of all, never wanted anybody else to be that for me. I remember certain men, I don't think they ever like tried to be a dad, but I remember thinking, okay, I'm not going to let this person be my dad. Like I have my dad. I'm, and I'm, I don't want anyone else to fill that role. And eventually I, I had to make the cognitive decision, especially when it came to my youngest uh, sibling, uh, that I am not his father either. Like I'm, I'm an older brother, right? And an older brother is an older brother. It's different from being a dad. Uh, and yet if, if not able to do that, if I wasn't able to do that, then I'd continue to kind of function as an older brother to my sibling. I'm mean, sorry, as a father to my siblings. And that would be unhealthy for me and for them to have that kind of expectation of roles on each other, right? Uh, and so I, I don't, uh, I don't recommend that doing that kind of thing, but I definitely didn't want to do that on my own. And I'm glad I did that because it helped me to prepare for when I wanted to be a father, right? If I had continued on and thought like, okay, I'm like this dad, then once I did have my own child, whatever pattern of being a father that I had, I had established with my own siblings, I would then continue on with my own child. And that probably wouldn't have looked good, right? But instead, what I did was, I said, okay, I'm not their dad. I'm not a dad yet, whatever. And then I prepared becoming a father in, in, in deciding what kinds of the, the styles of fatherhood that I wanted to, to, uh, you know, to use um, in the future. And I would talk about more of that in, um, as they're coming up, but just this idea of walking with excess weight is, is that concept of the burdens that we, we end up having on ourselves because of the home we grew up in and then having to carry that on uh, into the present and future. Now, uh, the first thing I have highlighted here and sharing on the screen is these 
are these uh, two, what he calls two essential biblical truths. And so number one, the blessings and sins of our families going back two to three generations profoundly impact who we are today. And he gets that from quoting uh, out of the book of Exodus uh, um, two times, Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 34. Uh, Exodus 20 verses 4 through 6, uh, it says, uh, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth or beneath or in the waters below, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is the Ten Commandments passage. Then he says, uh, continues, uh, punishing the children. Sorry, I should go back. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but love, showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then uh, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 through 7, the Lord is the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of parents to the third and fourth generation. Uh, and as an example, uh, Scazzaro uses David and he says, you know, when David murdered Uriah in order to marry his wife Bathsheba, God declared, now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. That's from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. And then he continues, family tension, sibling rivalry, internal strife marked his children, speaking of David, grandchildren, great-grandchildren for generations. So there's this idea in the, in the scriptures in the Old Testament, uh, just in, in the narratives that we're seeing and some of the texts that we've read, that God warns people that their actions can have negative consequences for generations to come. Now, I don't know if if uh, the passage is indicating that God's going to actively do things so that uh, a family is messed up for generations, like he purposely sends sin into their lives uh, to to mess them up. And, and we read in other parts of Scripture that God doesn't self-tempt anybody. Uh, but what, what we can, I think what's, what's simple to decipher here is that God is acknowledging to to people that are choosing whether or not they should follow him, that they're both negative and positive. Um, their decisions have both negative and positive consequences. And, and those consequences can play out for a long period of time, longer than what you realize. A lot of times people think that their, that their decisions, their consequences are short term. Uh, you know, it just impacts me. It's not going to impact the next person. Or my, the next person will be okay or they'll get over it or whatever. But the truth is that, that you know, what, what the things that my father did uh, were um, extremely impactful on our generation. And, and not just like my myself and my siblings, but also just everybody in the family that had contact with him. Uh, even those that didn't have contact, a lot of contact with him still having negative effects from it. Uh, and and I can see that there there was a pattern uh, that was established from even before with his family that that set him up for his failures, right? the negative consequence. Uh, when my grandfather was uh, so he he was not a Christian. He was a Hindu. He was a, a a big name in in the Hindu community. Is a, a Brahmin. It means it's like you know, the high caste. Uh, and so they were very wealthy. And one of the things that, that high caste uh, Hindus did was they, they had, well, not just high caste, everybody pretty much did like their fortunes, right? Like, what are they going to, what's going to happen when they get older? They read the stars and the signs and whatever it might be. And he received a fortune that he was going to die when at some point, you know, in his mid twenties. So that's not good if you want to be married and have children, you know, people hear that kind of inauspicious uh telling and so you know families don't want to marry the guy so he went off to be on his own joined the indian army uh and then he met my grandmother who was a believer uh her uh her, both of her parents were dead it was just her and her sister she was she was a nurse for the in for the also for the army and uh but she was a believer and but she was because of like not having a father and arranging marriages and all that kind of stuff she was single 
And so my grandfather met her in the course of his duties and he proposed to her, said, you know, why don't we get married? He's a Hindu guy. She's a Christian girl. She's like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and, and then, so he's like, are you decide I'll leave. He came and he left for like three weeks and came back and she had decided, you know what, I'll go ahead and marry him because no one else is going to marry me. And that's the way he felt about her. Right. So that's how they got married. Right. Not the best decision. Now it turns out he was an alcoholic. He'd been drinking a lot. And, and it's interesting, like alcoholism in, from in, in India is, is, is prevalent. And especially in South India, like you can see it uh, as as an issue, right? And so, uh, I I need to find out. I need to I double check. But I'm this this pattern of him drinking and stuff was a problem for a while. Now, eventually, he was he he got saved, and he stopped the drinking. And he says that he still struggled with smoking. Then he prayed about it because he didn't want to do it anymore and he stopped. Uh, but that's a pattern of, of drug abuse that my uh, that my uh, father continued on. Right now, uh, there, there are other issues there also. There's there's secret keeping. Uh, and that kind of stuff. And that really was a problem. Also, keeping secrets and lies. And and Skazro talks about that with the story of uh, with Joseph and and that whole generation. We'll look at it in a moment, but it's interesting to see that these are problems that exist in uh, in families. And if if we we're not paying attention, what Skazro's quote says there, and we see in scripture, those those negative consequences of those actions will continue to affect generations forward and forward. The sins just kind of carry on and carry on. And that's something we have to be aware of, right? Uh, the next thing he says, number two, discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family of origin and relearning how to do life God's way in God's family. Okay. Now that's a that's a mouthful, right? But what he's saying there is like. When we talk about Christianity, you talk about the faith and and spirituality. Uh, it's it's kind of it's not enough just to say like I'm saved. You know, there has to be an active effort into looking into the patterns that you come from and trying to and evaluating them and then stopping the ones that need to be stopped. Okay, and that's part of the discipleship process when you follow under those who are imitating Christ, and so you can see. The patterns that Jesus lives by, and then you can choose to follow that pattern, and then in doing so, breaking the patterns established by your family's forge. Uh, now, as we continue on in the text, I'm just scrolling next to the next part. Uh, I mentioned earlier that he had uh, explained this pattern that was presented in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, everybody, we, we all, like those of us who know the scriptures know the story, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, the, the, the one who chose God, Genesis chapter 12, or the one that God chose to, to start the, the Jewish nation and, and all the associated blessings with that. And I will bless you and bless all the families through you and so on and so forth. But there were problematic issues that they, that, that, that Abraham exhibited and suffered and suffered consequences for it and that those those actions continued on in his family right so as it says there a pattern of lying in each generation that's one thing right abraham lied twice about sarah went down to egypt oh he shot my wife that that happened um and then isaac and rebecca's marriage was characterized by lies jacob lied to almost everyone that's why his name was the deceiver Right. I uh, remember how he fooled his brother Esau and lied to his family about for a blessing and everything. Then 10 of Jacob's children. So if you remember the story of them uh, taking Joseph and throwing him into a pit, they lied about that also and to keep this family secret. So there was this just this lying that continued and started from Abraham. Right. Uh, then there was a problem with showing uh, favoritism, which which destroyed like the relationship between siblings. Abraham favors Ishmael. Like he, it just means that he loved Ishmael, right? It, I don't even know if, if we can say for sure that he favored Ishmael. He just loved Ishmael. But the issue was there in the eyes of Sarah, where she 
she she she was jealous at the relationship there, and that's why she sent them away. Uh, Isaac, you know, favored Esau, and so Jacob went ahead and started doing all the deception and everything else, so he can get that position that he wanted from his brother. Uh, even though they're born as twins or whatever, but Esau was born first, so holding on to his brother's heel, that kind of thing. But that caused issues, and then Jacob favored. Joseph and in favoring Joseph, once Joseph has these dreams about what God was going to do for them, his brothers, you know, um, reacted with uh, with jealousy. Right. And so that was a pattern there of favoritism. Uh, and then uh, the next one was brothers experiencing cutoff. So I just mentioned that Isaac and Ishmael's relationship was affected. Now, I don't know how. Much was affected. The text doesn't tell us a lot about what went on. It does tell us that when uh, Sarah died, like Ishmael came. When a Abraham died, Ishmael, Ishmael, I sorry, I should say when Ishmael came. When uh, Abraham died, Ishmael came. They buried their father together. I, I kind of don't assume that they didn't get along. I feel like maybe they had some kind of relationship. But either way, it's an assumption, right? But the idea is there was separation at some point when Abraham had to send Hagar and Ishmael away. Uh, because of Sarah's jealousy and just the abusive situation of all that. Then Jacob ran away from his brother Esau, if you remember, for years and years and was scared and everything else when he finally met up with him. And then Joseph was cut off from his family when his brother sold him into slavery, right? So you can and you can see a correlation between the favoritism problem and the uh, then and and the family members and siblings being cut off from each other. And then finally, there's, he says, poor intimacy uh, in the marriages. So Abraham had a child out of wedlock. And obviously, there was like a problem there. And it wasn't just like infidelity. It was Sarah and, and the whole thing about having children. And so that was a problem. Isaac didn't have the best relationship with Rebecca. And Jacob had two wives and two concubines and like Leah, Leah and Rachel. And that whole thing was all disaster. And so while... All that is going on. God is using them to establish the future of of the nation of Israel, and he's just, he's he's expecting to bless the whole earth through this one family. And eventually, we get to the birth of the Messiah, and that's what happens. But uh, it doesn't mean that the families were perfect. In fact, they were far from it. Uh, earlier mentioned David, and David, you know, as a man who was like the king of israel he failed in a lot of ways to properly raise and discipline his children and i mean in one instance he allows one of his sons to to rape his daughter and he doesn't do anything about it and then his other son revolts against him and it causes all kinds of issues and he, we read about the uriah and bathsheba incident uh and solomon was born out of that and then and just the fact that the sword wouldn't depart his house from there. And, and then Solomon had so many problems too. And then he went into the idolatry. And yet at the same time, God is using these people to build him temples, to grow the nation, to get them closer to God. Presumably, and and, and we, we assume David wrote so many of these Psalms, like, oh, he's a man after God's own heart. And Solomon, we, we presume, wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And we see like all this great wisdom and everything else. But at the same time, their family lives and their, uh, were terrible and has to be an indication then of their spiritual lives not being great. We can all have moments of clarity and moments of, of spirit-led intervention, but it doesn't mean that we were healthy to begin with. And I think that's probably a problem that goes on in the church today where you can look at stories and how terrible these people were to their families, but then see things. Things that are written in scripture and be like, oh, but look at this. And like, and so we justify their actions, say, well, you know, we can't be perfect or whatever. But I think the stories in the Bible to show us how good God can be through the our messes, despite our messes. And I think there's a there's supposed to be an encouragement for us to try to work on that stuff so that we don't keep perpetuating the same kind of pain and hurt in our families. Uh, in the future and instead try to try to show people and show our families how we love God and how that can be a blessing for a thousand generations like we uh, like read earlier from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, now Skazero goes on 
and continues to um, continues to just reading this comment guy here. It's just some kind of office bot or whatever. Yeah, it bothers me that it's there. Anyway, I just went to the wrong settings. We're gonna we're gonna clear this chat. I don't know how to get rid of this. Uh, anyway, um, so later on, Skyzor continues on, and he talks about how one of the things you have to look at are the rules of your family, your rules of your family of origin, and he comes up with like different categories or rules can be put in place, and to try to help us figure out what these rules are. And helping to learn what these rules are, it means to uh, open our our eyes up to and have awareness of the kinds of patterns that we might be following and that we we probably need to reconsider and possibly break free from, right? So he gives us the category of money and he gives an example like money is the best source of security. Um, the more money you have, the more important you are, make lots of money and you've made it. There's uh, some examples resolving, revolving around money for us. Money was more like scarce. You got to work for it. And when you get it, you got to spend it on what you need. Um, and then what was what's bad and still struggle with is like whenever we have extra, go ahead. And there were no rules about that. You know, there were no rules about saving and stuff. So, you know, you just naturally just end up spending because if you haven't had a rule for saving your money or using it wisely, then you're just going to kind of do whatever you want. So that was that's been a struggle there is that's actually a lack of a rule that's been problematic. Uh, the second area we look at and he talks, talk, he calls these the, the Ten Commandments. So the first commandment revolve, revolves around money. The second commandment re revolves around conflict. What are your family rules about conflict? Now, here he does a better job of being diverse in his description. Avoid conflict at all costs. Don't get people mad at you. Loud anger, constant fighting. Right? When, when we got married, we had to work on our conflict styles and we had to decide we don't want to continue these patterns into our marriage, right? And my family was avoid conflict at all times. Don't get people mad at you. For my wife, it's loud, angry, constant fighting is normal and like look for fighting or whatever. And so we had to learn how to fight, fight fair, right? So uh, that's, that's one way that we broke the pattern there uh, was by identifying, you know, like I, you know, and, and typically when you grow up in a home with an, with a drug user, that is the pattern is to avoid conflict you don't want to don't want to you know rock the boat don't want to be the reason why they go and drink oh that's it's not you it's just but this is the way we think and so that's one thing and then from a wife's family it was just like yell and scream and do whatever and that's just how they they get mad at each other but then they're like okay you know like they can see each other again it's not a problem for us if we do get to that point we're kind of like okay i'm done with you and cut you off so we had to work on that we want we didn't want that to be in our family we didn't want that pattern so we developed a healthier pattern towards conflict resolution. Uh, what about sex, right? Sex is not to be open and talk, uh, spoken about openly. That was definitely in our family. Men can be promiscuous. And women must be chased. Definitely a rule in the family. Uh, it seemed like my dad had these secrets and it's like, as well, as long as my mom wasn't, obviously aware of them like my dad was advertising it's kind of like we just don't talk about it but then when he did make things open it was a problem and so that definitely happened we're growing up and then uh, sexuality and marriage will come easily and that's like an assumption like if you don't talk about sex and it was eventually when you get to marriage you'll figure it out now some cultures are different some families are different they talk about sex openly everyone talks about sex 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 and then that, that's a whole other thing um, it's not always healthy uh, to do it that way either. The fourth commandment is about grief and loss. So how do you how do you show sadness? How do you show anguish and agony? Uh, some people believe it's a sign of weakness to show any of that. You're not allowed to be depressed. Uh, you're supposed to get over your losses quickly and just move on. In our family, I think it was more like get over it quickly, move on. Uh, if you're sad, you can just keep it to yourself. I don't ever feel like I was encouraged to talk about that kind of thing. Uh, it was more like there's like this fear, like if you hear about it, 
know, it meant something, you did something wrong and you didn't want to feel like you did something wrong, like that kind of thing. And my wife was very open, always sharing. So family is different there. And so I've learned, you know, like, and, and we've been talking about this, becoming emotionally aware is important for for your spiritual growth, your maturity in general. And so just being able to acknowledge moments when you are sad and you're depressed or lonely or whatever, it's actually part of, of being being a grown up and being a big person and 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 being healthier. And so that's something we uh we practice. And so I tell my you know, we've talked about my daughter and so on and so forth. And I think we've encouraged her to do that. Uh we just need to continue doing so that she feels free. Uh, expressing anger, right? Uh, that was definitely anger is dangerous and bad for us. Uh, explode in anger to make a point. I remember, yes, that's true. When you do get fed up, you just blow up and, and that's it. And then uh, sarcasm, yeah, all three of those uh, applied to us as well. And these are all things that you'd identify. Again, you got to figure out how to break it, right? Anger is not dangerous. Uh, anger is really, really important to understand. It's not inherently bad either. It just it's indication of of a deeper issue, pain, shame, fear, right? Sarcasm isn't helpful. Uh, it's cutting. It's passive. Uh, and so, if you really want to deal with anger, there are more ways to be direct. And then ultimately, forgiveness is important, right? And so, it's really interesting. Like if you are avoiding anger and expressing anger and everything else, then you run away from the idea of forgiveness. Because you, you need to accept anger to get to forgiveness. And forgiveness is one of the healthiest things we can learn to do in our families. Uh, just family rules, right? You owe your parents for all they've done for you. Don't speak about your family's dirty laundry in public. Uh, duty and family to culture. A duty to family culture comes for everything. Uh, that's definitely something that was a problem in our in our family. The whole idea that my dad can do what he was doing and get away with it was because of those rules. And so uh, I think we're only now starting to decide as a family, even my extended family, to break free from this and just start talking. Like we're just going to start talking about stuff because we haven't been for a long time. So my dad died in twenty in twenty or 2003 and it's just been like secret and quiet and be quiet and not talk about this stuff. But someone else has been like gossiping and talking crap. Uh, excuse my language to other people uh, that are outside of the family. We're like, you know what? We need to correct this behavior. So I think we're going to start breaking free from that and just start talking about stuff. Like this is what happened, you know, and this is what was evil. And I think that's part of the key to stopping the the effects of what happened to continue on to like second and third generations. We don't talk about it. We just continue the patterns. That's that's dangerous. Uh, commandment number seven is about relationships, right? Don't trust people. They'll let you down. Don't be ever hurt me again. Don't show vulnerability. Just the, the rules for relationships outside of the family, right? Uh, attitudes towards different cultures. Uh, only be close friends with people like you. Don't marry a person of another race or culture. A certain culture race is not as good as mine. I got to say, like, my, well, my older cousins, my oldest cousin on my dad's side, she married outside of our race and culture. And I remember just a lot of drama around that, but uh, I was always thankful she did that because she kind of opened the door for us to be able to do that, you know, after her, right? So I married a woman who's not Indian. I, I never, for some reason, I never wanted to. It was just like, I just, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not interested in marrying another, an Indian girl, but um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I just, you know, just didn't want that uh, and that experience. And so uh, her choosing that, path helped the elders in the family like moms and uh, my mom and then uncles and aunts or whatever to kind of accept that you know what our kids are probably going to marry outside the the our culture and so what's important then is like the debate faith and belief in jesus and and uh and you know even that's been changed uh but at least like for me it was easier but i but i mean it there are rules like that in the family and i I have to think about that with my daughter, right? Like, am I going to, she's, what culture does she have? She's Indian, she's Cuban, she's got some Jewish there. And we, I, I definitely want the faith. I want her to be equally yoked. I want someone that she, her, that she marries to be of same faith. Um, but it's not about culture for us either. It's about these family rules and, and emotional and, and being emotionally healthy. And so there's so much more than, than just the color of someone's skin, where they come from that matters when it could, when we get married, when we talk about children getting married. 
talk about success, getting to the best schools, money, children, all that stuff. And, and if, if, if you go down that list, like I'm not, I mean, I got into the best school, you know, University of Florida, one of the best state schools, but I didn't graduate from there. Graduated from a private school. Is that like a best school? I don't think so. Um, you know, in the eyes of people, I think it's a great university. Obviously, I work there. I think they we educate our our, our students really well, um, and we have a we have an international base and, and acknowledgement in the Christian world, but out in the secular world, not too people, many people know about it. And so, uh, in that sense, it's not quote unquote one of the best schools, right? It's not. Uh, not yet, just not one of the best schools. And then making a lot of money, not making a lot of money. I'm just doing my thing here and and we're we're living and we're comfortable, but we're not like super wealthy. And getting married and having children, we have one child, we don't have more than one. And sometimes that can feel like we're not successful. In the fact that we don't we don't have more. Uh and so definitely like I don't want my daughter to carry on those ide- ideologies into her future. I don't want her to think that she has to, in order for her to be successful, she has to get married. I mean I do I want her to be alone her whole life? No, but if if she's called to a different life than one like getting married and all that kind of stuff, then that's that's not up to me to decide, right? So I'm I, you have to redefine for yourself what success means, and then feelings and emotions, and and you know it goes back to the anger one, but you know you're not allowed to have certain feelings. Feelings are an important big one, and reacting with your feelings without thinking is okay. Just kind of funny because then that's saying that your family, your feelings are important. So, um, so these are these are like the Ten Commandments. These are the patterns you need to look at to see what needs to be broken as I move forward into into developing and and growing my own family. Uh, now, something that can help with this process is creating a genogram, and I'm going to show you the one that Scazzaro did. Um, and I know I did one for uh, for school when I was working on my degree. Um, oh, that's like really small. Huh? Let me see if I can if I can zoom that. No, it doesn't. I don't know. I don't know if I can zoom in on that here. Um, doesn't seem to have that ability right now. Uh, maybe if I if I edit the scene, and I'm I'm just scared that I'm going to accidentally end my stream if I do that. Um, so right up here it says Italian immigrants, Italian immigrants, and and you know the squares and circles indicate indicate male and females. Um, he puts their puts the names. So you have like great grandfather and great grandmother, great grandfather, great grandmother on on one side. Then you have, you know, their children and then, um, no, sorry, it's not great grandfather. This is grandfather, then their children. So that'd be his parents on both sides, like his mom on one side, his dad on the other. And then the dad marrying his mom and then his own, his, his siblings here and then his own family, boom, right there. Right. And, and the whole point of that, like, so you map it out and like, like I said, you start with a square. Um, I would say if you've got a generation after you, you want to do three generations, right? So if you've got a generation after you, meaning you've got your own kids, that could be the next generation. Um, and so you could do, um, I would do grandparents, parents, your, so your grandparents, their children, and then you have to, you should break it down even further, right? He doesn't really do all the work here, but like if you've got your grandparents and then their children, so that'd be your uncles and aunts. Um, and then on each side, and then you break that down into their marriages and their children. I think that would be like a really good in-depth way. So you have, you start with your grandparents on both sides, come down and you've got, then you've got your uncles and aunts, right? But then I would include here, uh, branching off to the people that they married, your uncles and aunts, and then their children. Um, and then, and you do that on the other side too. And then what you, what you're doing is you start listing just the things you know about them. And sometimes we, it, it becomes so much stuff. You have to color, color code it or something, but you can say like, you know, I know uh, I'll start with mental health. I know so-and-so was depressed or I know so-and-so drank a lot of alcohol. Um, I know this person got divorced. I know this person 
uh, has diabetes. You want to do everything like physical stuff, mental health stuff, emotional stuff, marital statuses, all that kind of thing. And you just break it down and you come down to yourself and the issues going on there. And if you've got children, then you'll, you'll notice that the family has this very clear pattern of brokenness. Uh, and it's a pattern that will continue if it's not dealt with. And one of the things that, that Skyzero talks about in this book, and he, I don't, I don't, I don't not like the way he handles it, but I also think uh, you could always go in depth, but you know, probably getting there, right? With the, it's been a while since I read the whole book, so probably getting there. But he talks about, uh, you know, he gives him personal anecdotes about himself and how he changed so that the curse can be broken. And that's probably like a good way to do it because uh, in terms of teaching it, because it, it is hard to explain, I guess. But uh, what I would I would say is when you recognize these patterns, which I was able to do before getting married, I finished my master's degree uh, when I was uh, 28 and 29, or it's 2012, so I was 29. Uh, and then I started working and then I, I got married, you know, in 2013, December of 2013. So I had about two years between master's program and marriage. And going through the master's program in counseling psychology, you figure out a lot about your past and you figure out about these patterns that have continued on. And I've mentioned before, like the depression I've suffered with. And so, um, and we did the genograms and, and, and so I saw all these patterns and then our premarital counseling, I talked about the conflict resolution. That was something that was done to figure out our pattern of fighting. Uh, and so, uh, and my wife had done a lot of work also, uh, not as much as I did, obviously getting my degree in that and she, she's a different field, but uh, I did a lot of work and decided, yeah, these are the things that I, I would like, God, I would like you to help me break. I don't want to be a liar. Lying was a big one. It's a, it's a huge one. You know, coming from an alcoholic dad who constantly lied and a mom who, you know, would want to protect the family and, and seek and secrets. And so that encourages lying too. you go to church, everything's fine, that kind of thing. Uh, and so you're not really, you know, exposing the truth about what's going on inside of you. You always had to kind of pretend. And then uh, seeing that that pattern went back to grandparents, uh, you know, I, while my grandfather was a great testimony for salvation and his relationship with Jesus and everything else, there were things and decisions that they made uh, that weren't weren't great and weren't healthy for their children. And stuff that they just didn't probably talk about and you can tell they didn't talk about it. and the kids that my uncle's aunt, my aunt, I should say, would talk about it because she's more open, but I, I can tell by the others that they didn't, they don't want to talk about that stuff in their time. Uh, and so, and I don't mean to be mysterious. This is that my dad, my, my uh, grandmother had asthma. And so they had to move to another climate and my, they couldn't afford to take all the kids with them. So they put them in like these temporary boarding schools slash orphanages. So, you know, so when your kids uh, rough and there's a lot of bad things that, that can go on in those places and did go on in those places. So uh, just this pattern of like of secrets and bad things happening and keeping more secrets to protect others from knowing about those bad things. Man, that was the biggest one. So I was like, I did not want my daughter to go through that. I don't want my daughter to realize one day that her dad's a liar. Isn't they does one thing and does says another thing all that kind of stuff. So I worked hard on it, in you know talking to the professors or your the therapist, but then also praying about it and say, Father, I don't want to be this way. Need your help. And by His grace, you know, every day I'm reminded of that, and I'm not perfect. There are times where I just might, by the lie of omission, not admit to something or say something, but then I eventually will. And then I feel better about it. And it's like, why did I keep that? You know? Uh, and that's, that's what it takes to, to break free from these patterns and to grow and to, to become mature. Right. And what's cool is, you know, the beginning of the chapter, he talked about, you know, the weight of it all. And uh, I've been losing weight, just getting healthier medications, helping you know, thyroid issues, whatever. And I still walk around like, 
feel like I'm still the same person, but recently to buy some new clothes. And so, you know, you go and you try on the same things like extra large. And it's like, oh, this is actually too big. But I knew I had to buy smaller things because my, my extra large stuff is falling off of me, my shorts and stuff. So I'd go and try large. And I'm like, okay. And then I try a medium just to see. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to try a medium. Medium fit better than large did. It's like, what? We're a medium now? And it's like that moment I realized, man, I'm really not carrying this weight anymore. Like it's, it really is gone. Like I'm, I, my body is changing. And I think spiritually with all this emotional weight, like I think about it and sometimes I am amazed. I'm like, man, I'm not carrying the weight like I used to. This is, this is really good. Like I'm actually healthier than I was before. And I think that's, that's like the moment you're looking for in your growth. Like, man, I, Actually, that's how you know. Like, it's been a pattern of changes, pattern of of distance from what you grew up with, and you're like, man, I, I've actually dropped that. Like, I'm not lying, like my family used to, like I used to. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not, uh, I'm not drinking and 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 abusing my family and, and being a tyrant, uh, like my dad did. Like that weight is actually gone. I don't have to keep wearing. Uh, this kind of external cloak to kind of indicate like oh, that's still there, you know, like just keeping uh, and being in a slight like, meaning like hiding my life. I can, I can expose myself to the world because I have nothing to hide. That's actually like a huge weight. I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, you know, I've got a viewer I don't know if you're a bot or whatever. Like, I don't know, but this stuff's going on. I get some more views on YouTube and I really appreciate that. But I'm like, I'm I'm always nervous about exposing myself and my family to the world. And I realize I don't have to be because there's nothing that we have to hide. Right? And yeah, like attacks are going to come, but I'm not I'm not worried about that either. Like the enemy can try whatever he wants. Like I'm not worried about that, but it's more like, man, what if people see me? But you know what? They can see me because I'm healthier than what my family of origin was. So I don't have to hide anymore. Um, that's probably been the biggest weight that dropped off my shoulders this past weekend. Uh, and so that's uh, looking at the past to figure out the present and then work on the future, right? So it's, that's kind of how that works. Hope that all makes sense. Again, I thank you for watching. Uh, please feel free to reach out, hit up the website. Uh, you can contact me through there. That's pilethoughts.com, T H A. Y-I-L. If you're watching on Twitch, the links are available there. Follow me on social media, which uh, is starting to grow a little bit. So I'm thankful for that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest. I th I'm thinking about switching over to YouTube streaming. I feel like I don't even know who's watching this live right now, but I feel like YouTube streaming is going to be a platform that's more open to more people uh, that are out there that are not familiar with Twitch, but they'll they'll go on. And I can still use, obviously, use Twitch for gaming. I don't know. I don't know maybe we'll use YouTube for gaming. Instead also, but uh, just keep that in mind and uh, I'll make sure I make the proper announcements, but I'm going to pray about that, make that decision uh, fairly soon. Anyway, thank you again for watching uh, and hope you're blessed uh, by the, the session. And don't forget that tonight at 6 p.m. I will be gaming. Don't know if my daughter joining me, will be joining me today because she's been feeling sick. I know she's going to want to, but we'll see how she's feeling after we go and visit doctor and, and figure out what's going on so thank you again for watching and i'll see you next time